<laughs> okay. Well, if you share the screen and then use this as filming him, that's right. He doesn't, but he doesn't have his. Uh, he doesn't I have the adapter. Oh. But he doesn't have Zoom on his thing. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Well, while we're while Greg's setting up here, I'll just do a little quick intro. You want it on your computer? Uh, yeah. Can you can you get HDMI? <laughs> Think that works. Okay, so I asked uh, uh, Dr. Stone to talk to us about, you know, the metals company and about the, sort of the sort of processes to and, and controversies and struggles to to get um, resources from the bottom of the ocean and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, this is um, a cool light I got about all places up at um, Lake Arrowhead, super inland. I don't know how that works, but um, but this anglerfish is a really cool uh, piece of uh, sculpture, and to me, it really seems to symbolize. Um, what I, I think Dr. Stone is going to talk to us about uh, uh, coming up here, but it's um, really cool stuff, you know, deep sea, like amazing, weird world, uh, the largest biosphere on the planet, as we talked about, and all that kind of great stuff, um, uh, but also kind of, in a sense, kind of cobbled together, right? So there's kind of wonder there, and there's mystery, but there's also logistical challenges, um, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, now that, as we'll hear, now that we're getting closer to actual um, extraction, there's more people asking, hey, do we really need to do this? Are we sure this is the right thing to do? And again, with everything we we talk about in this class, there's always trade-offs, right? There's never a perfect solution. There's never a, uh, we'll just leave this thing pristine and then it'll be perfect. So we, uh, we are into forced options in our planetary system at the moment. And this is one uh, that you guys will, will need to engage with. Um, and then just for, uh, oh, why does that look like that? Okay, that's better. Um, and then for David and Greg, this is, so this is your guys' data as of right now. We've only entered about 100 and, 150 or so polls so far. But um, this is where we are right now with uh, Greg. With, with, uh, so, so as of just the, the first initial entry, when we asked our general public in LA, Ventura, Santa Barbara, Hey, we're, we're for the transition to uh, you know to defossilize our economy, defossil fuel, decarbonize our economy. You know where should we get these materials? Um, and about a third of the people say the deep sea. About um, a fifth say the Salton Sea, which is you know close by, and there's been a lot of investment by the Biden administration and before to do various um, lithium in particular extraction. Um, the thing where I think most of us are most worried about our forests in the developing world that don't have the human rights, don't have the environmental protection. Oh, um, oh it's all good. It's, it's, you're, you're good. You're good. Are you done? Uh, almost. Uh, and then, yeah, that's fine. It's all, it's all good. Yeah. Here, yeah, yeah switch, switch, switch. Um, uh, and then, uh, so that's a little bit of context. So, so the most common category so far, right, is is other where people are said something like never mining or I think we should mine over here right so that that's sort of the catch all but for the discrete ones um, deep sea seems to be the most favored by general random public type person when we talk about the more specific things that we need to do the transition on people are a little bit more hesitant right so so we're about evenly split right now in California about our stated state policy of transitioning so only sell all new uh personal vehicles will be evs by 2035 right so right now it's about as many people are supportive of that as our uh i think that's a good idea in one shape or form versus folks that think that's a bad idea so that's the context and so with that uh uh greg uh ready steady uh go dr yeah. greg stone yeah hi hi everybody i'm really looking forward hey. I was really looking forward to this morning. How much time do we have? Uh, we go to, you know, left, we got about two hours. Oh, okay, so we don't have to rush. All right, a little bit of a game show here. Anybody know what this is? No idea. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ear candle. <laughs> that went unclaimed, unfortunately. These are amazing ways to keep your ears clean. <laughs> and I was going to give away one of the rarest books I have 
to the person who knew that. But, uh, <laughs> I'll come up with another question later on. Who, who's got a definition of how a battery works? Anybody understand how a battery works? Okay, who said lithium? No, how does a battery work? Like I'm in an elevator and I don't have much time. Okay, um, there are a select amount of cells and each cell has a life and once you expend that life, you can't use it. Um, and it, most batteries run off of lithium ion, ions. Um, okay, that was about 180 <laughs> degrees off the, the, the answer, but, 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 I, but I applaud you for being so courageous. So I'm gonna give you this book. Oh, that was so. That was wow. David Prater won the National Outdoor Book Award. I, when I dove to Antarctica, I went to Antarctica some years ago and dove into the world's largest iceberg, the size of the state of Connecticut, and uh, that's the account of the story. But your explanation was was so so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you had the right components. Uh, lithium, actually, we're beginning to find uh, chemistries where we don't need lithium. Lithium's becoming uh, less of a, uh, a critical metal, but uh, nickel is becoming the critical metal on the planet. And uh, nickel is one of the elements that you see on that table you all had to learn about in high school. That, uh, and there's only one place where you can get that stuff, and it's inside a star. Uh, stars are the only places where elements can be made. That is, uh, uh, an atom, and we don't even really know what an atom is. You know, you know, the little picture you see in your head with a center and the electrons circling it—that's just fantasy. We have we have no idea what it really looks like, but that idea kind of fits the equations and makes things work. But um, uh, the way. Batteries work is uh, they have a, a, a flow of electrons, uh, and in many cases, lithium is one of them and can be a catalytic piece, but not by no means the most important. Uh, and the electrons will flow from a low density element uh, through. Um, See, I'm not very good at it either, so <laughs> I, get, I wouldn't get a, I wouldn't get a score either very high myself into a uh, low density area, and that flow of electrons is, is of course electricity, right? And the great thing about the batteries that are coming out now is that you can recharge them, you can reuse them, you can recycle them. In fact, they can last forever. Uh, we can get to a point in the foreseeable future where there's an end to taking material out of the earth. You know, you, you think about it, we, <clears throat> anybody know what, okay, here's, this is a book question. <laughs> what year was it, what was the first year that 8 billion people were alive on the planet at the same time? There you go. Oh, no, no, you're starting. Wasn't that? It was 1800. That's why I was thrown off. You had all the right numbers in there. So it took us, and we as a species, where they think, evolved about 200,000 years ago, right? So imagine 200,000 years to arrive at a point at which there are 1 billion of us alive on the planet at the same time. Guess how long it took us to get to add another seven or eight billion? 200 years, order of magnitude. And that's the industrial revolution that you are all the victims of, that I prospered in, my parents created it, and you will suffer the consequences of it. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, would like to do whatever I can to pass on what I know about it and what you can do in your lives to uh, rectify it because we we operated for those first 200,000 years on this planet like uh, dilution is a solution and it was for the longest time you could put as much as you wanted in the ocean didn't matter it was so much and there were unlimited resources you know the tribes of homo sapiens would go over some mountain use everything up 
go to the next one, next one, next one. And we finally inhabited the planet, every part of the planet, about 100 years ago was when we put the first people in Antarctica 24 hours a day. So we're recently inhabitants of this planet. We're recently the dominant species. We recently run this planet. And Buckminster Fuller back in the 1964, anybody know who Buckminster Fuller was? Wait, here we go. Uh, a, a visionary architect actually, but like most smart people, if you're really good in one area, you, you're pretty good in other, a lot of other areas too. And he used to call it Spaceship Earth. Um, and it, to you, they may, that, might, that might sound trite, but back in the 60s, it was a revolution for people to think about it that way, that we were a rock, you know, traveling at uh, 67 uh, million miles an hour right now through the universe. We're traveling at uh, 67,000 miles around the sun. And everything we have, everything we ever have, have had, and everything ever we will have is on this rock. And the only places that we can live on this rock is a very small part of it called the biosphere. And the biosphere, I'm not going to play any games with that. You all know what that is. To give you an idea of how small a part of our planet the biosphere is, if you take an apple and you assume that the skin of the apple is like the atmosphere of the earth and the biosphere extends from the bottom of the ocean to the top of mountains where things can live, that's the biosphere. Below the bottom of the ocean, it gets too hot. You start running into the mantle. You might get some exotic um, thermophiles and whatnot, but you don't really have a biosphere and you get too high, it's too cold and you're in the air. The, Biosphere of the Earth is 1% the thickness of an apple skin. 1%, not the apple skin, but 1% the thickness of the apple skin. So as you see the Earth flying around, you think, oh, look at that big planet, all this stuff. It's, there's really nothing there. <laughs> there's this like piece of tissue paper wrapped around the edge of it that we can happen to live in and, and prosper. And we have over the course of 200 years, uh, spoiled, fouled that nest um, in ways beyond uh, belief. I um, grew up around Boston, uh, but I think what really happened is my mother was pregnant and the plane had to make an emergency landing in Boston. And she had <laughs> me and I got swapped in the maternity wards. I love California. I love the way people think. I love the energy. I love the inclusiveness, I love everything about it. Um, and I uh, didn't really uh, have a, uh, let me see if I can advance this. I'm, these pictures are kind of strange. That's not supposed to be all red, but that's the Gulf Stream there. The thermohaline circulation of the oceans is what keeps uh, the planet really in balance. And, um, a paper just came out that said, I couldn't believe it. It said it was a 99% chance. Did you see that? <laughs> the, the author said, we have a 99% chance of the Gulf Stream stopping in 10 years something. Why not just say it? <laughs> um, and in addition to that, we um, the, the Aussies finally woke up. I wondered when they were going to. And they uh, admitted that the Antarctic uh, sea ice is not forming as strong as it should. As a matter of fact, this year, 30% less than normal. Usually, Antarctica is a continent that's white, so it reflects sunlight. And we need things that reflect sunlight, not things that absorb it. And this is the first year that, uh, in 7 million years, that we're not going to get the full extent of the, of the winter freeze, which does two things, reflects sunlight back in space. It also helps run this thermal haline circulation system. And just for those of you that may not know, it's a very simple system. The water comes down here, it gets cold. Cold water is dense, so it sinks. There's fresh water melting off of the glacier, uh, which covers Antarctica up to two, three miles in some places, and it sinks. It hits the bottom and it goes north, so the way it can go, and it's down to South Pole. And it can stay in circulation and in play for hundreds of years before it comes back to the surface. But this, this transfer of heat 
and this this dynamic the dynamism of it i mean look look at every other planet in our solar system they're all well the rocky ones anyway they're, they're all pretty static you know they're like dead <laughs> ours is this vibrant uh alive place and it's because of the ocean and uh we're in big trouble and it's coming a lot faster than we thought uh I mean, I've seen it coming for 25 years. I was watching the news two weeks ago. And saw these two kids, young scientists, climb out of a Boston whaler in Florida, took his mask off. And he said, oh, I wouldn't believe how white the corals were. Oh, it was terrible, you know. And, and I'm sitting there going, have, what have we learned? Have we not learned a thing? Um, you know, coral bleaching is uh, it's at an epidemic uh, uh level now and i'm working on a project that uh like to work with you guys on with sean's program and this where we're finding heat resistant corals that we can maybe reconstruct a, a new coral system on the planet because uh what happens when the ocean gets too warm the uh, zooxanthellae that live inside the coral feed it sugar from the sun and it gets too hot, the zooxanthellae, they leave. The coral can then eat stuff for a little while. Corals are pretty cool because they kind of farm food in their gooey parts of their bodies. And then they can pick stuff out of the ocean and eat it as well. Um, there's a band of coral across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, right along the equator, that's been exposed to El Nino oscillations uh, for a millennia. And El Nino oscillations uh, mean that every, it, it's an aperiodic uh, oceanographic event. It happens every four or five, six years. It's, it's good that it's not regular. It's kind of keeps, keeps you on your guard. Uh, that has bred a whole population of corals that can withstand these enormous temperature swings. But it's on, it's on these small atoll nations uh, like Kiribati, you may have heard of, Nauru, um, um, uh, Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands. Uh, there's a bunch of them there. And I, I believe that those corals uh, are going to be the future of our coastal coral ecosystems because uh, there's also a very strong correlation between uh, poverty and the developing world and coral reefs. The coral reef is the refrigerator, it's the food source, it's the it's the protection against storms for many hundreds of millions and millions of people along coastlines um, that aren't as lucky as us to end up like we have. I mean, we're we're on the we're on the back of the pig here in America. Everything is so. You know, no matter where you are in our society, it's pretty okay. You know, um, I spent a lot of my time working in least developed countries in the South Pacific. That's what I. Uh, once I learned the uh, the situation down there, I, 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 I didn't have a choice but to work on that. It started out by me finding out they had a median life expectancy of 46 in this one country. And I would come back from meetings and we'd have a meeting and I'd go, hey, where's where's Johnny? And they'd go, oh, oh Johnny's dead. And then they get back. I says, what, what, what do you mean Johnny's dead? You know, for them, it was normal. And they said, oh, Johnny? Yeah, he died. And I said, well, 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 tell me about it. What happened? And they said, I don't know. What was it with Johnny? Was it was it, uh, was it uh, diabetes? Or was, it, was it heart disease? Was it this or that? They, they didn't even know. But that, what bothered me the most is they accepted it <laughs> as their lot in life. Kind of like, you know, this is where we ended up. You know, our, our life expectancy here in the United States keeps going up. You know, it's, it's now it's, uh, I think it's 80 or something. Essentially, as I was growing up, if someone was 80 years old, they were really old. Now it's 90, right? It's been like a 10 year shift in this thing. So the world's screwed up. You know, there's resources are where they shouldn't be resources uh need to be moved around there's a lot of greedy people in the world and money has driven a lot of this stuff so all i ever wanted to do was go diving i love diving i 
I grew up outside of Boston and I used to watch Jacques Cousteau documentaries and go down to the beach and um, look for old bottles. And, and I tried to find a career in diving and I was going to be a commercial diver. Uh, and this guy that I talked to, he looked at me and he said, you know, this is really just underwater construction work. And I said, yeah, I, I, know, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. It looks like so much fun. It'd be great, you know. And he said, kid, <laughs> I think you might I think you might have something else in you. So I looked around and I found out, well, I can do marine biology and science. I'm not the biggest math whiz in the world, but you don't have to be. You just have to be careful. You have to be able to write. You have to be honest. You have to you know, go out and look at things and you have to tell people what's going on. So I uh, learned to dive when I was 16 and um, I stopped counting dives 10,000 dives ago. I've been in all the oceans of the world down to 20,000 feet. And sadly, I knew that guy that owned that sub, the Titan in the Atlantic that went down a couple months ago, Stockton's a friend of mine. In fact, I was invited on that cruise. And uh, he was uh, crucified on the news. I couldn't believe it. I, 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 I went on the news to defend him because he wasn't there to, to defend himself. What he was doing was not anything that any of the other people that would criticize him, him have done, because <laughs> I know them all. <laughs> it's a small community. Um, you know, I said, I said, look at how many space shuttles have we lost? <laughs> <laughs> that was I, there was this admiral from the navy who was giving me this crap but well we don't send anything down unless it's been tested you know, nine six ways to sunday and i said oh does that mean that uh any advancements have to occur in a department of defense or in a nation you know can't 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 very smart entrepreneurial people who are uh, careful he was careful he wasn't as crazy as people think but anyway i love the ocean the whole thing top to bottom it's, uh, and I don't know why, but it's just something about it um, does things for me. So I uh, started studying whales and uh, then got into the degree programs, got a bachelor's, and master's, PhD. And, um, but I always wanted to get back to invertebrates. I love marine invertebrates. They're my favorite uh, body of animals in the, in the ocean. Um, the uh, so I, you so so I ended up in a in a predicament where I was I I got my wish I was diving all the time, uh, but what I started to see as I was diving was not what I expected. I I saw uh, an ocean that was not the ocean that I saw in TV shows that Jacques Cousteau shot. That was not in books. I saw an ocean that was in in terrible condition, and. Um, Oh, this is just to show you where the growth is coming, the growth and the future growth in our population. And I'm not, this isn't meant to blame anybody because uh, there's no blame to go around. It's all of us. But the, uh, you see big bubbles in Asia. Uh, 1800, Africa. And a, a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, the uh, the energy consumption is what is the is what gets you. It's because we churn up so much energy. You use about twenty five to fifty times more energy every day than someone that lives in China uses, or Africa, or something like that. You've probably seen those pictures of high, uh, high school kids in Africa doing their homework under street lights outside because they don't have uh, electricity. Uh, country in the South Pacific that. Uh, the president was a, a good friend of mine, and he's related to my wife, actually. Um, he installed uh, solar he, uh, lights on a lot of the outer islands of his country, and he noticed an, an, a tremendous increase in population growth. <laughs> uh, no, no, in, in population decline. I'm sorry, population decline. Because now people had something to do at night. <laughs> <laughs> they had a light and they could sew or do something like that before. But prior to that, you know, the sun would go down and it would be dark and they'd be in bed. And, uh, that's how it went. So, <clears throat> so I, I got out here and I, I, I'm looking around trying to figure out what, to, what the hell to do with my myself. Because uh, 
you know, I, I need a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, and, um, and also once I learn about something that can be fixed, I feel there's an obligation to act on that. There, it's a, it's kind of a moral thing with, with me. And I think it is with most people. They just don't think about it that much. Um, this shows you the global growth in populations. I'm not going to go into this. You guys kind of know most of this. Um, but what's important are the resource uses. And that's what I want you guys to solve for me, for us. For I don't have kids, so it's not my family, but for the world. Uh, you know, early on, we lived in these weird places where there was plenty of stuff. And then we, the empires came up. And then the energy industrial revolution hit. And we needed uh, fuel that would that would replace human muscles, and suddenly a gallon of gasoline could do the work of you know two hundred people. And uh, so, where the fuel come from? It came from the ground. It turns out there were these tribes walking around the deserts of Saudi Arabia, kicking sand and leading camels, pitching their tents at night, and they kicked the sand, and this black goo came out. And the next day, they became the richest people in the world, the Saudi, the, the Saudis and the, that whole area. However, their oil is almost gone. Um, Dubai's oil is gone. Uh, Saudi Arabia is really the one country that's still got quite a bit. But the point of it is it's a, it's, it's a non-renewable resource. It took millions of years for that to occur. You all, do you all know how oil and gas is made in the earth? Is there anybody unclear about that? Because that's a, let me give you, a, it's a, what happened was there was a long period of time where the earth was uh, very stable. The, the oceans did not circulate. And uh, we had dinosaurs on land and we had a uh, smaller cascade of animals in the ocean. And everything ended up sinking into the ocean till the bottom of the ocean was this thick layer of organic material. And then that got capped by uh, sediment. Things happened, plate tectonics moved, and 99.9999% of it went away. But, but enough of it got locked into these chambers, naturally, of rock. These rock chambers, these pressurized chambers. And over the course of uh, a million I think 90 million or 10 million, 100 million years, that organic material would transform itself to oil or natural gas. And then when we put a pipe in a hole into that pressurized chamber, it comes spurting out and we can burn it. Um, so we've been on this drunken spree in the Northern hemisphere for the last 200 years having parties with the, all the carbon we're burning and enjoying ourselves and all this. And our friends, our fellow uh, earthlings down in the global south have not had the same benefit. They, they haven't had the same benefits that we've had. And they're going underwater now. There's uh, several nations that I, I think will be uninhabitable within about 20 years in the South Pacific. Uh, there's five to 6,000 people a day are moving inland from in the Bangladesh area towards already overpopulated, depopulate, poverty-stricken cities because the, the, the slope of the ocean there is so gradual. Um, when it goes up a little bit here in Santa Monica and somebody's cleat to their $200,000 sailboat gets wet, you read about it you know, <laughs> that there's sea level rise. But um, we caused the problem and we've uh, devastated the lives of uh, many, many, many people. And when I give these talks, you know, people always say to me, um, you know, well, what can I do? That sounds terrible. Or what are they going to do? What are those people going to do? They don't have a home. And I said, that's not the question. I said, the question is, what are you going to do? Because it would be like you having a party in your neighborhood and somehow your party accidentally lit your house, your neighbor's house on fire and it burned down. And the next morning they're on the street with a couple things with no place to live. And you're sitting there drinking your champagne going, oh, you poor thing, what are you gonna do now? 
I mean, that, that's really the, the, the relationship of this whole thing. And I've worked in the UN on the climate uh, issue, and there's so much resistance by uh, the United States, Western Europe, uh, all the countries that have money want more money, and they don't want to pay the costs that got them to where they are. They should be providing assistance for uh, it's called um, um, uh, the clause is um, just uh, what's it called the uh, disaster disruption and change costs. And I've worked very hard trying to get the global north to take this spirit on. And I have a program. <clears throat> it's called the Indigenous Climate Adaptation Scholarship Program. I bring kids up from these nations in the Pacific Islands to go to school here so they can figure out how all of us rich white people think and what we do with our money and how they can get it. And um, it's small, but it's showing some great results. You know, the, um, the first inaugural student uh, has a full-time job at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He's an indigenous guy from uh, Kiribati. Uh, uh, Sean has met him. And after he was here for a month, you know, he came to me and he said, he said, you know, I, I knew all about sea level rise and, and climate change because his grandfather was the president of the country. And he said, but I just accepted it. I thought it was just like a, you know, natural disaster. He said, I didn't realize this relationship that other people are doing things that are doing this to us and we're not getting any uh, say in the matter. So it, it's a it's a very disturbing situation going on right now. So I went from uh, Conservation International where I was the chief scientist for that group. Anybody heard of Conservation International? Yeah, oh, there's a book. <laughs> <laughs> so when, I, when I played the uh, Harrison Ford, like on the ocean, right? That 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 was one. Yeah. Oh, Harrison and I did that together. Yeah, he, he's a he just lives down the road here. He's a great guy, loves the ocean, and uh, doesn't like to take credit for it. The way these things work, by the way, is you light them up and you stick them in your ear. <laughs> you get this, you you get this air lift effect where it, it pulls the wax out. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, the age of oil is past, and the industry knows it. And there, uh, those greedy sons of bitches are finally coming around to uh, reorienting to this and trying to make money off of the next phase. And I say that because they're digging out these files that they had from the 1960s and 70s that forecasted what's happening right now, and they just could not help themselves to the the riches that selling oil gave them. You know, you have you have one industry where you sell somebody this material, they have to burn it up every year and buy more from you. Or do you give them materials that they don't have to buy anything more from you and they can keep warm and and that uh, they picked the one that you know they made more money. So I really do think there was some um, evil going on there at certain levels of those companies. And I'm generally a business friendly scientist. I believe we need to work with the businesses. Uh, I work I work for a company because the only way we're going to change anything in the world is if we get the the uh, the the money moving in the right direction. Remember that phrase in the, there was some movie called Follow the Money. I think it was all the president's men. They were trying to give him a hint about how to find out where things were where the where the answer was. Well with, in this case follow the money. Once a year, every year, this $1 trillion is donated to nonprofits. That includes churches around the world. $17 trillion is spent by governments. That's government money, taxes, that sort of thing. $200 trillion is what flows around the private sector. So we want to be in that private sector. We want to be directing that money. We want to be using it. We want to be educating people. Because in my experience, people want to do the right thing if they only knew what it was, is what I've found to be the case. I have a top secret clearance with the U.S. government, and I used to give briefings down on, uh, on Capitol Hill Congress. And I come up with these complicated graphs trying to explain to them what was happening and what we needed to do. And, and I'll never forget this congressman. 
he said, she said, Dr. Stone, just shut up, just shut up. And I, I felt really bad. And he said, he says, what, what do you want? <laughs> he said, just tell us what you want. And we'll give it to you. We don't want to hear about all this stuff. So they, people are genuinely confused about what's happening. And, they, and they're, it's unbelievable that they don't believe it. Um, that part of it is, uh, is, is just phenomenally uh, unbelievable to me. You tell me that Congress is confused by things. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> this was back. This was back in the nineties. This was back. This was back when it was quite controversial. Really vaguely yeah. But these guys that I was uh, reporting to were willing to uh, go down this road a ways. Uh, so, oil is the past. What's the future? The future is um, we either vacate this planet. Uh, we either go back to hunter-gatherer societies, we either radically change the way we live, or we use everything that we've learned during the Industrial Revolution to make this place last forever. And this book is, the first half describes what the Industrial Revolution did to the ocean, and the second half of this book describes what we've learned through the Industrial Revolution can be used to save us and the earth and, and the oceans. Um, I don't think that there should be any nonprofits in the world. I think all everything should be for profit and everything should work to the best interests of the planet and to the best interests of the group. This idea of these polarized sides, you know, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys, it's it's just crazy. So I chose to um, leave the, I was working with the UN at the time and just got fed up with more meetings and more um, talking and nothing happening. And this guy walked up to me, you have any of those nodules? Uh, yes. You have any of the I don't know what I did No, don't worry about it. It's, it's hard, don't worry about it. Yes, oh, I got there's a tooth in there. Can't show that. He pulled these two rocks out. He said to me, "He said, do you know what these are?" And I said, "I certainly do," because I had studied them. And he got this. Oh yeah, I got this guy. Oh. This is something different. But he he, he pulled out. Um, there you go. Here, pass that around. And pass uh, pass that around. He pulled out a couple of these rocks and he asked me if I knew what they were. And I said, "Yeah, they're part of the town." And they formed on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean over uh, course of 10, maybe 20 million years. I haven't figured out the vintage yet, but I think it might be a spot for us to whale boat. I don't know if you guys have any idea of them, but let me know. But it's a spot for us. Oh, and this is interesting as well. This, this really surprised me. There are hundreds of thousands of, of megalodon shark teeth out there sitting on the bottom. And we come along and we see it there. And this species went extinct 275 million years ago. So it's been sitting there for that amount of time. It shows you what... Uh, how stable that environment is and how how many of these there were. Because during the course of a lifetime, one megalodon would shed uh, approximately 300,000 teeth. Uh, that's a fossil. It'll look to you like a tooth because it's got the teeth there, but it's all fossil. So I said, I know what those are. What, you, what can I do for you? And he said, he thinks this is their, the best path forward in the world because we're going to need a lot of metal up to 600 or a thousand percent increase depending on the type of metal and we need it yesterday um, on a terrestrial mine if you decide you want to start a new project today it'll be 15 years before you get all the buildings built the people kicked out the roads put in uh, all that stuff uh, but these rocks are sitting down there right now. We did a collector test about four months ago that went seamlessly. And I actually think it 
does the bottom ecosystem good um, because we don't bring anything up with us but these rocks and there's no waste. Every component that you're holding in your hand is, is used. There's no toxins and there's enough metal out there to last humanity for hundreds of years, even if we kept throwing it away. And it's only about a half a percent of the, sea, the seabed, right? Now, there, there are unknowns. There's a lot of species out there that we don't know yet, little teeny things that you haven't seen. And you'll hear, I, I mean, the good news is, it, I, and I, I know this room is full of you, people care today, people want to do something about it. You know there's something wrong. And I'm telling you, and you've heard it from other people. And they've latched on, some people have latched on to this and said, oh, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop this, you know. <laughs> and they've got it backwards. You know, this is something, this is a solution. This is not a problem. This is a solution. If you want to solve a new problem, go find all the non-point source pollution coming down the Mississippi River and eutrophying the Gulf of Mexico. That would be a real hard thing to do and a very necessary thing to do. This, on the other hand, is a... Uh, uh, a very uh, positive action that can happen. So uh, the, the guy wanted me because I had a, I was known for marine conservation. I had a good reputation in that area. And he thought that, uh, you know, if I stood up and explained it to people, it would help. And it did. I gave a lecture in Dubai three years ago, sort of came out of the closet. And boy, did people get mad at me. I couldn't believe it. It was like 2,000 people in the audience, you know, all my old colleagues from the World Wildlife Fund days, Conservation International days. And they came up and they said, Greg, how can you do this? And they were spitting mad. This one guy actually was spitting. And I said to him, have you ever been next to a nickel mine? And he said, no, but. And I said, well, you go look at a nickel mine and come back and tell me if you want to live next to one of those. Because if we don't do something else, what will happen is what has always happened. The developing world will do it at whatever cost. It doesn't matter what regulations you put out there. They, they're self-regulated <laughs> and things are gonna get worse and worse. The North-South divide will increase. The conditions, the, rema the remaining wilderness areas in the, in the Southern Global South are gonna get destroyed. The remaining nickel, I, I keep focusing on nickel because that's the, the most energy dense uh, part of this whole equation. Um, the remaining nickel is in nickel laterite deposits, which are, you wouldn't recognize it as a metal. It's like in soil and it's found underneath, guess what? Tropical rainforests. So you, if you want to get this nickel, you've got to tear a tropical rainforest down, dig up the dirt, add chemicals to it to make it toxic in order to leach out the metal you want. And then you got this pile of tailings you got to do something with. And then you replant the rainforest, right? And so they, they very pompously come up to this issue and they say, well, how are you going to restore the bottom after you've taken these rocks away? And, you know, there's, <laughs> there's no, who wants to restore rocks that sit on the bottom of the ocean? There's, we, we are actually leaving 15% of the rocks on the seafloor. Uh, and the ones that we're leaving are the ones that the uh, the uh, nodule obligate species preferred. Anybody know what that term means? It means uh, <clears throat> an organism that can only live on, on a nodule. It's obligated to live there. So we recognize that fact that uh, we want to address that. And if you hear wild numbers of uh, species down there in the deep sea, what they're talking about are foramps and little tiny microscopic creatures that we don't even count those on land. We, we, we skip over them. <laughs> it's something we've never bothered with. So there's some very unsavory, in my view, uh, science going on here where um, scientists that I used to respect are misusing uh, the system. You know, science is a set of rules that keeps us from lying to each other. Is, a, is one way I like to look at it. And um, it's a way to get an anchor to windward, another way I like to look at it. And they've come out and they like to see their name in the paper and, and uh, they will not, you know, they've got their worm or their, 
is 4M. You know, 4Ms are what makes sand. Anybody been to Bermuda? <laughs> the 4Ms in Bermuda are pink. <laughs> That's why the sand's pink in Bermuda. <laughs> and there's there's thousands of species of these things. They're like bacteria kind of stuff. So that's what we're talking about. That's 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 the issue when it comes to polymetallic nodules that we are discussing, is these little microscopic creatures that nobody really cares about, that don't form uh, unless you want to, you know, come up with some wild butterfly effect hypothesis, that don't have a, a, a role. It is impossible for carbon to get from the deep sea to the to the surface. They were. They were coming out with that for a while, and I said, "It's phys it, it defies the laws of Newtonian physics for carbon to get from that area to the top, no matter what you do." So, so I saw this as a really good solution, and I said, "This is how I want to spend the next few years of my life: is taking what I've learned and trying to uh, uh, bring people along." And there's a group that are lost. They're they're like alcoholics, they're just too much, they're too far gone. But but there's another group that are that have not gone that far that uh you sort of drawn a line in the sand and and they're backing it up. Uh Jared Diamond uh, being one of them, you might have heard of him, he's a professor over at UCLA, very well respected. Sean is gonna join our committee. He doesn't have to have an advocacy position, we just want him there uh, more for his perspective. I don't know what he thinks, I don't know what you think. Um, uh, but we are uh, uh, owning this issue. Uh, we're we're a Canadian company, um, and uh, have about forty employees. We put it together in a sort of a, a system of uh, different connections. So, uh, and I'm and I'm getting uh, I'm tired of this. Uh, work we've just completed for took us three years where we conducted the world's largest environmental impact assessment ever about a thousand miles from here where we looked at the ocean from where the birds fly at the surface down to the sea uh, surface right down through the water column and about 10 centimeters into the sediment and it cost us oh about $60 million to do all this, okay? So we've really done our homework. You know, there's gonna be a story to tell. And still, still you get people who have put their, um, their, their names out there on this and are too concerned about their little egos to let it go and, and know when they're wrong. You know, if, that's a hard thing to do in life. And I've had to do it a few times. Um, but it, it, it's you, you, you've got to go where the science leads you. You've got to go where the facts lead you. Uh, I'm just putting these up as a little, um, oh, I always like this picture. It kind of shows what happened. <laughs> <laughs> we came out of the ocean and uh, made, made all this great stuff happen. And then we said, okay, what are we going to do with the trash? Oh, we'll throw it in the ocean. <laughs> Um, I understand from uh, Sean that you guys are interested in microplastics, and I think that's a wonderful idea because I've proposed, and I'm, I'm I sincerely hope that uh, we can find a way for the this university to become involved in some of the science that we're doing with the samples here on your campus, and also bring in students from overseas. I believe that can be paid for by uh, international groups like the Asia Development Bank, the World Bank, the Global Environmental Facility. There's a lot of need to, to export IP into the populations of these countries that are that are uh, being impacted. Anybody know about this seed vault? They call it the Doomsday Vault. Yeah, I was, I was shocked when I went up there. National Geographic always offers me trips, I can go on any of their trips I want. I just sit around and be myself. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up in Svalbard. And there's there's an old coal mine up there that has some um, very stable conditions. And they reckoned that that was the best place to store things for eternity. So that the day that we do ourselves in, we can go back there and get the seeds that we 
spent all these years, you know, refining to make our civilization the way it is. And problem is, it's getting so warm now, the coal isn't staying the same temperature. <laughs> it's warming up in there. So um, this stuff is happening and it's real and don't let anybody uh, tell you otherwise. Um, this is a very interesting picture. And I forget where I put it here. <laughs> oh, I know where I put it here. That's the, that's the footprint of this country I'm talking about. Uh, when you consider the amount of uh, ocean uh, sovereignty that it has, the law of the sea, uh, I don't know if you guys have studied, you studied the law of the sea? Uh, we, we've touched on it. We will get more into it later, but we've yeah. briefly touched on it. As a, as a civilization, we've gone from the family unit to the tribal unit to regional units to eventually made it to countries and... Uh, and we, we left the ocean as a common resource that uh, everybody owned. Uh, but then in the 1950s and 60s, we started to get smart about it and said, well, we better do something. And we decided to say 200 miles offshore from every rock that's above water at low tide belongs to that country on the seabed. Anything beyond that is open to the world. So suddenly these tiny countries these least developed small island developing states became giant ocean states, a lot of power and a lot of a lot of potential resources. And we're working with several of them, and I'm hoping to uh, give them a turn at the trough, become a Brunei of their own or a, or an, a Saudi Arabia if they do it the right way. Um, so that's that's what you need to think about in your in your lives, um, material, energy, food and climate. And there's a day every year called Earth Overshoot Day where somebody sat around and figured out that we've used up all the energy and the material and the food and we've messed the climate up enough for one year and everything beyond that is extra on top of it and it's gonna make things worse. And last year, it was, uh, this is the trend line. So we currently need two planets, basically the size of Earth, with the same resources that we have on Earth to continue the lifestyle that we have now. I'm not just talking about lifestyle, I'm talking about life, you know, being alive here. And the last time I checked, I didn't, I've never seen another planet anything like ours near us i don't know if anybody else has but uh so this earth overshoot day is uh something to keep an eye on this is our drill i don't know why these pictures are does anybody is there a computer whiz yeah. here that knows how to I think the colors right. can you get the colors right yeah, yeah. so i'm sure you're 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 beginning to questions are beginning to emerge in your mind like how the hell they're going to get these things up to the surface and Why can't that stupid guy get the thing to look right? Me, not him. Um, so I, I, I said yes to the uh, the request this gentleman made of me. He's an Australian guy who uh, was, was about 55 years old, made a lot of money doing something else and uh, realized that there was more to life than making money. And he decided to pursue this to... Uh, to do that. I find a lot of people like that um, in the world. And a lot of them somehow find their way to my door for some reason. And most of them are willing to make the sacrifices necessary to really uh, make a difference. But this guy, this guy was and is. Because I told him, I said, yeah, I'll come. I'll work for you. I said, but you've got to realize if I see something I don't like, I'm going to walk away. And that's something that, you, that won't look good for you, the investors. If someone had a question. Yeah. Are you arguing with it? Yeah. Okay. She know what to do? Yeah. Oh. All right. She gets a book. I do not know. <laughs> Scarlett gets a book for reversing the colors. Give me my books back with all the ones I didn't. <laughs> yeah. 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 
not in here. There should be an option that just. Yeah, I could believe it. I think that's really a helicopter. Yeah. Like LAX to uh, San Diego. Right. And so and there's there's there. There's there. There. Yeah. I went up the coastline. I saw the, the buildings. buildings. Every house had a pool. This was by a car. Oh, had a boat or a trail. Sweet. Okay. Have you gone and booked it? Now to get back to your uh, yeah, I, I, right here. There you go. Yep. There is a God. Okay, so so what did we do to, to try to solve this? Um, we uh, first thing this guy did is get me on board and ask me if I thought the uh, that it was had a chance of being less invasive than oil drilling, and uh, from a, from what we knew, knowing we needed to know a lot more, and I I could see that it had a lot of potential, so I said I'm in, and. Then we needed to find partners to put this together. This is a big deal. This is the last, I call it the last major take from Mother Earth that we're gonna do. Because over these 200,000 years, we've taken things from her, him, her, it, whatever they are supposed to call them. And um, if we get this right, everything should be recyclable from now on. The guy that won the Nobel Peace Prize last year for chemistry won it for uh, process of manufacturing molecules. And I, what I found most interesting was a reporter, as he was leaving, raised his hand and said to the guy, he said, what, what was the question he asked? He said, what's the biggest problem on earth right now, do you think? He looked at the guy and he said, we're running out of atoms and electrons. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> We don't have enough stuff <laughs> to keep, even if we could transform it, we just don't have enough stuff. So we have to get smart about this. And uh, metals is the way to, to start. If once you get energy, you can go from there. Um, and the way you bring these things up is you have a vehicle down at the bottom. In this case, there's three of them. Uh, and if any of you, grew up near a farm, you probably know what a combine is. So this is, they're kind of like a combine. They're about half the size of this table. Maybe maybe one, they might get as big as the table. They go down to the bottom and their buoyant, their, their, their buoyancy is set such that they don't sink into the bottom. They kind of just float right at the bottom. And then we have use something called the Coanda effect, which um, is when you, uh, squirt a little bit of water at the uh, nodule, pop it up into the air, into the water, and then it gets sucked in. And then there's a chamber that shakes it for a second to get the rest of the sediment off. And then up the pipe, it goes to the surface. Now you're gonna wonder how the hell do you get a rock to the surface? It's four kilometers down. The way you use something called an airlift, we put a uh, high pressure hose down a kilometer and pump high, uh, compressed air there. And as that compressed air rises, it creates a very strong vacuum effect. I've used them quite a bit digging up shipwrecks in my time. Uh, that's what I'd rather be doing is not looking for shipwrecks, but I'm doing this instead. <laughs> um, and, and they come up and we found that we could collect uh, one, 100 to 200 to 300 tons an hour uh, in this fashion tomorrow. And, uh, bring them to a facility in Japan that has the right set of kilns and furnaces to burn this thing and produce four metals from one mine. Now you don't find that anywhere on land. On land, you've got to get four different mines. You don't have the co-occurrence of metals. I mean, this is like a dream come true. That's why I can't understand my colleagues in the conservation community that are throwing rocks at it. They're like, you know, they got to have something to throw rocks at. So. And I say to them, listen, if you think this is a bad idea, you tell me a better idea and I will quit what I'm doing and come work for you. And I never get a response back. Um, this paper just came out last week. If you have access to science, you can read it. But it's a, uh, um, let me see what this, yeah, 
interestingly, this was just published last week. It doesn't even mention polymetallic nodules, but it talks about what metal mining has done to the earth over the last several hundred thousand years. I mean, it's a very, it's a very destructive thing. Um, and just to show you, I mean, you've seen this kind of stuff. This is what it looks like, you know, on land. And, and think about the fact that the earth is about 70% ocean, about 33% land, you know, something like that. If just that alone, to me, says, what part do you want to keep in better condition? It's the land. It's where we because we need land to live on. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't want to destroy the ocean. That, and that's the irony is I love the ocean at that depth and have been at that depth for more times than any of these other jokers have. And uh, and I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to see it happen. I'd rather we didn't do it. But what else are we going to do? And maybe, maybe someone in this room has an idea. And that would be great if you did. Oh, this is something that's fun to listen to. Does this have volume on it? Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll play it. See if we, there we go. Far offshore, in a remote area of the Pacific Ocean called the Clarion Clipton Zone, on a vast underwater desert, sits the world's largest known source of battery metals. Trillions of polymetallic nodules have formed here over millions of years as metals from seawater have deposited around grains of sands or fragments of shell, growing into potato-sized rocks that rest unattached to the seafloor. We're now developing the capability to responsibly recover these remarkable rocks. The process will begin with our collector, designed to pick up nodules from the seafloor with minimal disturbance. Our flow lift system is designed to aim a jet of water at the nodules along the seafloor and then channel and lift the nodules inside the collector. The system will also lift around five centimeters of seafloor mud, which will be separated from the nodules inside the collector and returned back to the seafloor. Most of the mud particles will settle within tens to hundreds of meters from where they were picked up, while the finest particles may travel up to thousands of meters. Our adaptive management system, a mix of deep sea ecological data, marine sensors, and cloud-based AI will create a digital twin of our operating environment. This system will enable us to monitor what's happening in real time and give eyes and ears into our offshore operations to the regulator and stakeholders. With this information, we can adapt to stay within acceptable operating boundaries. Next, the nodules, as well as seawater and a small amount of residual mud will travel upwards on compressed air bubbles through a steel pipe production vessel. Once aboard, these nodules will be separated from the riser water, along with any excess nodule and mud particles, which will be returned to a depth below 1,200 meters. The nodules will then get transferred to a shuttle carrier and head to shore. Here they'll be offloaded onto a conveyor and into a port side plant powered by clean energy. Inside the plant, the nodules will be first heated in a rotary kiln and then melted in an electric arc furnace. The melted mass separates into two streams, a manganese silicate product that goes into production of manganese alloys and an alloy that contains the nickel, copper and cobalt needed for electric vehicle batteries. Using a multi-step hydrometallurgical refining process, these battery metals will be recovered from the alloy and turned into the metals needed to transition away from fossil fuels. We expect that the entirety of each nodule's mass can be turned into products. The plant will be designed to produce zero solid waste. In the future, the plant will be able to recover these same metals from end-of-life batteries and return them into circulation again and again for many generations to come. We'll try to figure out how to do this. We're looking at maybe never selling the battery, maybe always keeping the battery and leasing it to people. So that when they wear the car out, they have to give the battery back to us or buy a new car. Because the, the way this works is that there's no way you can build a car that will last as long as these batteries. These batteries will last for, for uh, uh, 500, uh, 500,000 to a million miles. Um, 
Now, it doesn't mean that this should encourage people to go out and drive around with their hair flying in the wind and, you know, saying, oh, how wonderful I am and how wonderful the earth is. We're talking about this is moving, you know, products around, food, the things that we need for our society. So we have to do a little something everywhere. This isn't, there's, there's no one silver bullet that's going to solve this problem. But if you have a, if you had a segment in your studies on mining, deep sea mining, and I just wanted to share with you this view. Now, there are two other types of deep sea mining. I'll just mention very quickly. I don't think I even have slides for them. Uh, one is called uh, cobalt crust mining, and that's bad. Uh, no cobalt crust. <laughs> you hear that say bad. Uh, because, and the reason is you're tearing apart uh, seamounts underwater. I love seamounts. And you can't uh, repair them. Here, you're just picking up rocks. The other type that is probably okay, but I'm telling people not to do it just so they can have something to say not to do, is to tear apart old uh, hydrothermal vent chimneys. <laughs> the ocean floor, you know, the mantle is very hot. And you get, you get down below the crust, the earth is very, very, very hot. And that water makes its way to the surface. And that's how you get hydrothermal vents. You might've read about them or seen them in shows. And these vents are ephemeral and they, they occur and they'll burn for a year, a day, a decade, a thousand years, you never know. Then it'll just stop and start up someplace else. And going down and you know cracking these things apart and bringing them to the surface, I don't think is a big deal, but a lot of people do. So. And we don't need them anyway. That, that, those are mostly the precious metals. There are three kinds of metals, by the way, that you should be aware of. Precious metals, the gold, the silver, that kind of stuff. Base metals is where the action's at. That's where the energy storage is. Nickel, cobalt, manganese, um, and then copper, of course, you need for the wiring. So these nodules have the essentials, um, and it's all there. And I'm going to conclude, we'll keep talking if you want, but because uh, I'll keep talking all day. I've got all kinds of slides here that I could show you. But the, the thing that's really great about this, <clears throat> which I think drove me towards it more than anything, is that it has a policy that right at the beginning, at the top, when the nodules come in, the company and the country, if you have to be associated with a country, you can't just go out and do this on your own. And it's overseen by the UN. There was decades of negotiation uh, to come up with this. A portion comes right off the top and is redistributed to the developing world who didn't have to do anything for this as a bit of a makeup for how badly we uh, developed, evolved, um, behaved uh, over the years towards these two sectors of our of our world. And that's the part that I, I find most exciting is to think that, is it possible that this is a win-win-win for everybody? That it's better for the earth, it's better for the, the uh, companies, it's better for them. Anyway, um, that's a quick overview of things. I'm sure I've said, said things that you might have questions about, and I can look and see if there's some slide that you cannot live without seeing. Uh, you, you've seen this kind of stuff. You don't need to see that again. Oh, there's the there's the book. That I, and I will give these away to people, even if you didn't say anything. Um, we're going to be having a digital twin, so that you'll be able to sign online from your room at home at night, and you'll be able to see what's going on real time. We're 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 shooting for maximum transparency so that people can. Because people are suspicious, they think, "Oh, they're they're underwater. We can't see what's going on." You know, we we know they must be doing some terrible things. So there's going to be tra radical transparency. Uh, we're starting a whole new era of this kind of uh, uh, work. Hello, welcome to the Nori presentation. Oh, we don't need to listen to that again. I think I think we're there's one last little clip. I'll show you. Then we'll stop. Because it's got me in it. <laughs> uh, oh, 
well, maybe not. Okay. Any questions for now? Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned that you wanted to somehow or make the smaller island nations kind of like Saudi Arabia in the future. Was that with the deep sea mining is for them or how, like? Well, I, I don't want them to behave like Saudi Arabia. No, that, 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 that's, 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 but economically, give them more power. Yeah, economically, it would work that way. Yeah, it would it would they would have a disproportionate amount of resources that the whole world needs. And and hopefully that's what's 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 happening right now actually is how to how to distribute this in a in a in a way that's rational. We've already figured out by the way, we, we're a private company that happens to be registered in Canada. We might we could be registered anywhere because we work all over the world. Um, but we needed a country to um, sponsor us for every site that we work at. And the one they were working at is Nauru. Anybody ever heard of the country of Nauru? Well, they are soon going to be making, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year that they wouldn't have before. And there's no country that deserves it more than them because we went in there, we, the Commonwealth countries, and destroyed 90% of it digging up phosphate for fertilizer and whatnot, left it almost unlivable, and then left and gave them independence and shook their hand and celebrated. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of the economic side of it that needs to be worked out. And that's not my my cup of tea, but I can tell you that it, there are people that you know say there's a path forward and that it's a good one. Yeah. yeah. What kind of kiln do you need? Like you said, you live. Metals initially would be sent over to yeah, that's a great question. I, one of the things I really loved about this for me is because I knew nothing about processing metal. Uh, uh, there, those kilns you see in those documentaries, you know, with the big turning and the yeah, red stuff coming out. Yeah, uh, and and in order in, in order to take a nodule like ours, which has four different things in it that you want. You've got to come up with like a recipe where you first you heat it to this point, and this happens, then you heat it to this point, and that happens, and, and make it you know work out. We've done it, we've tested it with the nodules we've collected, and the battery manufacturers tell us they've never seen better metal in their lives, that it's really very high grade metal. Uh, I yes. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Oh, it's um, a pleasure to be here. You mentioned that you would be implementing leases for the batteries uh, in hopes of like possibly recycling them eventually. Yeah, we're we 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 can. The idea is that this company called the Metals Company will become a recycling company in like forty years, uh, and it will give us time to. Figure that out. Uh, we're looking at things like blockchain. Uh, I'm not blockchain, but so <laughs> to, to, uh, be able to identify the metal that we know, know it's ours, you know, this is out there in the world. Uh, and I believe that manufacturers need to take responsibility for whatever they make and put out in the world and, and where it comes back. Especially like the, the plastic, and I drink them, so I'm no I'm not above anything. But like those water things you drink, uh, you know, if you look at the real cost of drinking a uh, plastic bottle of water, it's probably five dollars or something. If you, if you really ran it out to the end of its life cycle somehow. So I think companies have to start taking responsibility from inception to the end of the life cycle of the materials. And we haven't gotten there yet. That's your job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Jake, and going off what you just said, saying it's our job, uh, is the metals company, are you guys, like, interested in any potential, like, maybe, like, internships or, like, positions at your company? Yeah, we are. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, in, I'm trying to talk him into, into uh, uh, developing a, a program here of some sort or another that would include metals, and uh, not just for, not, not just for us, but for the world, because... For, 
we're currently searching around for uh, kind of technician level people, yeah. and we can't find any. Nobody, nobody knows anything about this. Let me do my part. This industry, <laughs> <laughs> and if and if uh, in in our country it doesn't mean a lot, but if Sean and I were discussing the other day, you go to a place like uh, Australia, New Zealand, or Philippines, or Kiribati, and you say, "Oh, I've got a certificate in deep sea by deep sea mining." People will go, wow, you know, and the certificate could be the result of one class, you know. <laughs> um, there's really not a lot to know. It's uh, it's pretty much what I've told you. Uh, but people, it's new. It's uh, it's understandably confusing to people. I get that, and I I spend a lot of time uh, explaining to people, you know, how it works. Um, I uh, I spend a lot of time, you know, debating the finer points of the science with people about and that comes back to what do we value as as a society on this planet what do you value do you value a uh, fungus that lives at the bottom of the ocean more than you value fungus that grows in a rainforest do you, i mean there's all kinds of uh, i've written some papers about it that i can give to shine and can send around to you but this is no longer the earth of 200 years ago, this is a new place. This is, we've, we've finished our habitation of this spaceship. If, if you believe in ancient aliens, we were dropped here to get our act together, make things, and now it's ready to go. <laughs> and we've got to get it right. Um, uh, one thing that um, Buckminster Fuller did say after he called it Spaceship Earth is he said, it's too bad it didn't come with an operating manual. <laughs> so I kind of I kind of amused to myself that I'm what I do is work on the operating manual you know how do you, how do you operate this this spaceship the other day a few weeks ago this meteor missed us by uh somebody said it came between us and the moon oh quite a large object I mean it was a dinosaur killing size um so we we need to really get on our toes you know if we if we if we care to exist further, we don't have to. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. So in the little video when it was showing like the whole plant of like the processing plant with the kilns and stuff, that's a vision, yeah. Um, I was curious about like what if you had any ideas about what kind of clean energy you're going to be using and like yeah. the mechanism behind like. The fuel for the That's kiln. a good question. You hit the nail on the head. A lot of people think if you just plug it into the wall, you charge your car, you've done it, right? You've got to trace the electricity back and find out how it was made. And it has to have either come from nuclear or hydro or solar or some other mixture of that. Otherwise, you're not doing any, any good. So we've made a commitment that when we build this and we don't have the money to build it currently the u.s government i i think may step in and build it at some point because the, the way the government works is they, they're asleep on issues until well they're not asleep they're just busy they're busy with other things until something hits them in the face then they're going to take action and they're probably going to say okay we need these metals this company can get them if there's a problem in the world we can park an aircraft carrier on top of the site bring the nodules right back to California, process everything we need, done. You know, I mean, that's pocket change for the Defense Department to build that kind of a processing plant. Um, that, that answer? But, so, so just for clarity, so this, like, the first processing is, like, the first phase, right? But then eventually... Oh, yeah, yeah, I should explain. I should explain. As a startup company, we're, we're, the, we're the first arrivals. There's no other companies doing this there's a few lined up behind us but we're up front so what we had to do is to, we had to prove that we could pick them up with uh not much environmental damage which we did and then we had to prove that you can actually run it through these kilns and come up with the, the metals because it's never been done before and we found a, a company in japan called pamco on the north island of japan that can do it and they they love the idea they said man just tie up to our dock we'll give you half of our facility and you can just make as much metal as you want 
And the last piece, uh, which will be uh, probably announcing before Christmas is the user. So once we get the those components out on the table, you know, we say, okay, it works. <laughs> There's a demand, we can start doing it tomorrow and let's do it, let's go. Uh, then then we'd, uh, but it, it, it would, it, ideally it would come back to one place like that and, and all be done in one place. And you could put a nursery school next to it. You know, there's no, harm to anybody. I just know that there are like a bunch of options of what we consider like clean energy. Yep. Um, oh yeah. The way oh the way like what I are, would like, say, the most priority. That's a discussion to have what you guys talk about. I mean just flippantly and off the top of my head I would just say you know carbon low carbon energy production. Um, and as as long as you produce the same amount of low energy carbon production somewhere in the world, it's okay to pull electricity out of carbon producing electricity, which I took me a while to get my head around. Because at the bottom line is you're, you're uh, at first we were looking for deep water ports that had dams. <laughs> So we thought we could generate electricity through, you know, hydropower. But as long as you pump the electricity back into the system at night, uh, you're doing the same thing. But you're right. You've got to look at all aspects of it, not just the collecting the nodules, but also driving the trucks around, um, driving the boats around. Um, boats will go to batteries, too, uh, probably right after trucks and cars, because uh, boats are so massive, you can put lots of battery in a boat and it doesn't doesn't really do much to its efficiency. And I, I work for the metals company. I also founded a I started a organization called Pole to Pole Conservation, co-founded it here in California. Uh, because you know I can't uh, go to sleep at night unless I know I'm working on something towards a solution. Uh, Dave is uh, kind of our chief of staff, keeps everything running. And um, our board members are uh, former college president, uh, former head of state from Kiribati, uh, uh, some good looking guy named Ian Summerhall. There's girls always go crazy about. <laughs> and um, uh, who else is on the board? Oh, uh, oh, Steve Pitone, yeah. We, uh, we, our policy is, uh, I don't take any money. I, I don't get paid, it's volunteer. And the money comes in, goes out. Uh, we do have to pay contractors to do things because there, there are costs. But the, the things that I've seen and the ways that I've seen people living, I, I just couldn't do it with a clear conscience. You know, I, 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 find, my, I find other ways to make money to pay my costs. So. This is all uh, I expect all the executives and senior people to kind of follow that suit. Not not everything. You got to pay up some people. But, but it gives us the opportunity to hire the best people to write like the, a white paper or a strategy and then let them go. Um, so it, it turns out to be give you good quality, but also not. One of the reasons I left the NGO world is uh, I, I drank too much Kool-Aid, right? <laughs> I, I love going to these parties and, you know, we had uh, all these movie stars and captains and of industry there. Uh, we made them feel good by what we were doing. Uh, uh, and then I realized it was like this big hoax. <laughs> we were, we were, flying people in from these developing countries and putting them up on the stage and oh it was terrible and I, I got out of there as quick as I could um, because you know that we're all on one planet and we need to uh, we need to work together and not have these these walls there is no career in conservation there's only a career in life and it can be any job as long as you you know are aware of how it impacts the world and, and what you can do 
to uh, uh, help with that. You're all welcome to, uh, you know, be aware of what we're up to and we're five years old now. Um, so we're quite young still. Sean and I are, like, as I mentioned, I'm trying to develop some collaborative programs in the university here. We had, work with Alta C and uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. We try to be catalytic, uh, you know, do, do small things that work and then let them go and scale on their own. Uh, yeah. Um, I know that you said that uh, your company and your extraction uh, process would be, it would have a very a small effect on the ocean as far as like uh, its impact um, or any of the, of the negative impacts on the ocean. It's my um, view, yeah. But would you, do you think that like once this technology gets to that point where it's ready, uh, maybe like other countries or other companies would try to do it in a quicker way and Huh? What would be your thoughts yeah. on how to regulate? Good question. Them? Really great question. And it's one of the reasons that I've been pushing our company to, to do this first, to get the first environmental impact statement in. Uh, when I showed up on the scene, they didn't really have any idea what to do. They said, uh, we're going to go down and look at the bottom and look at the surface. And, you know, <laughs> and, and I said, oh, no, we're not. We're going to look right through the whole water column. And count the birds, look at the plankton, look at the jellyfish. We're going to go down into the sediment. We're going to look at the cephalopod breeding sites. You know, I, I kind of laid out a plan of how we were going to give it a comprehensive look. Because you're right, there are countries that don't have uh, awareness, uh, uh, knowledge, ethical, uh, moral um, concern. I, I don't know what, what you call it. But all I can say is if we're able to get through the starting gate first, they will be a very rigorous model for other countries, other companies and countries to have to look at. So for that question, just, just for clarity, so um, can you talk a little bit about International Seabed Authority? So uh, based in Jamaica yep. and, and sort of the process that we're at. So the metals company is the farthest along in the process that's been, you know, decades in the making to do the actual Extraction. Can you talk a little bit about that? Love to. Yeah. Do, do you all know the, um, you know, that they have these levels of, you grade a planet by numbers, right? Planet number one, and yeah, that's where we're at, is when we're still trying to kill each other <laughs> and ruin and ruin the planet, right? So we're at that level. <laughs> um, planet Terry level two is when we stop trying to kill each other and we have some control over the planet's climate and avoidance of asteroid destruction and things like that. So we're on our way to two, hopefully. Um, and that's gonna require um, some political system that doesn't exist right now. I, I call it a benevolent, benevolent dictator system. Uh, uh, and the UN is the, you know, the, the UN has been kicking around for the better part of the 20th century, in various forms uh, as a way for the world to get together and sit down and talk and make decisions together. But it doesn't, it doesn't really work. There's a half a dozen countries that kind of run all the major decisions. And then everybody else is told what to do or doesn't do anything. Um, but it's what's all we got. So it's the worst form of government for the planet, except for all the rest. <laughs> so from the law of the, from the uh, United Nations Charter, it enabled countries to get together and create agreements, treaties, or or uh, and the, the best treaty they made. It's widely regarded the high most successful internet piece of international law ever is the Law of the Sea, and it uh, enabled the creation of an agency called the uh, International Seabed Authority in uh, Jamaica. They usually put them in countries that are developing because it stimulates the economy. And uh, that means anybody that wants to go on the high seas beyond that 200 mile zone that every country has, 
you have to go to them and you apply and you're compared apples to apples and uh, they will get some revenue from this to operate uh, once it gets going. That's where their money will come from. There's a, there's a lot of money in this industry. And this is like one of those industries where there's a lot of bees <laughs> in, in the in the sentences. So once it gets off the ground, there will be um, a regulatory system out there. Uh, I had hoped that guy that got killed in tight Titan uh, Stockton's friend of mine. He and I were discussing how his sub would be a good one to do drop, drop checks on those uh, on the sites to surprise people. He didn't he didn't build that submarine to take people to Titanic. He took it. Um, he was doing that to uh, sustain uh, resources to keep his research and development going. I was invited on that dive. But I couldn't make it. He was. I, th I thought he was mistreated in the press. Actually, they made him out to look like he was an idiot, and he wasn't. Um, so the ISA, uh, uh, the guy that runs it is the highest paid employee of the United Nations, a guy named Michael Lodge, and that's how important it is. And all the countries in the world can join it. Most have, not all have. The United States never did. We, the United States does not belong to any international treaties. I don't know if you've gone over that with Sean, but we play this game where we don't sign anything so that we can't be held to anything, but we take what we want. <laughs> um, we spent a lot of money out there in the 70s uh, looking for a Russian submarine that went down and we called it uh, a survey for polymetallic nodules when in fact we were looking for a, a nuclear um, missile uh, sub. And there's concern that the United States is gonna use that work as evidence that they were out there first and are going to start mining, but they're not going through the ISA. So it's now we're getting into politics, and it's not where my head goes easily. And so the ISA has carved out uh, 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 holdings in places like the, the, the CCD, and um, they're setting the, the rules, right? And so companies right now are, are doing their due diligence. Oh, yeah. Impact. Well, the way it works is, I can tell, I see what you're after. The way, this is how it works. If you're a country and, and you want to enter this business, you're either, a, if you're a developed country, you have to pay the ISA $500,000. You have to go out and do these surveys and uh, assess the value of the nick of the metal on the bottom and put half of that value into a, a pot that developing countries can come and choose from. So they don't have to go through the, the research parts. And then you can take the part that you want and start to work on it and do this. So it has a lot of principles in it that I think the world needs. It's got the sharing principle, this idea that we're all, all in this boat together and we have to look at it that way. Um, and there, I, I can tell you, they're very hardworking people down there. They get criticized by uh, Greenpeace and other groups for for no good reason. Um, I used I used to date the girl, the gal that named the Rainbow Warriors many years ago. Uh, so I, I have connections to Greenpeace. I used to like them. I used to help them, but they're they've lost their way. They they're they're out there spray painting boats saying "Stop deep sea mining" out in the middle of the ocean. But they they stopped whaling back in the 60s and early 70s quite successfully, I thought. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to be worked out here on this planet. We're on that little, that little just keep thinking of 1% of that apple skin, that little area. We got to work it out so that it all fits together. And I'm counting on you guys to do it. And, and just to wrap that up, and so the metals company, and so so um, uh, they're you know, waiting for the final rules essentially to to set in, and the metals company has done all the stuff they supposed they were supposed to have done, and now we're waiting for the final um, uh, uh, ISA to do their stuff, um, and as of June, right? As of June, because uh, said some correct me wrong, but the the metals company has sort of you know, pull the trigger and said, hey, you know, it's, we need to get going here. And so as of June, they're 
you guys are able to begin. Yeah. Uh, right. Actually, we're able to do it now. Right. right. They, they, right yeah. Right. <laughs> when they were negotiating the treaty, somebody had the foresight to realize this was prime real estate for filibustering. They just keep talking and talking and talking. So they put a clause in that said, at any time during the process, a country can push the button that says, in two years, we're going to go mining, get the regulations together. So Nauru pushed that button two years ago. And that, and the regulations have pretty much been done for a decade. So they didn't, they didn't jump the gun. They didn't do anything bad. Um, and the ISA uh, is, is uh, scrambling to you know, get those things tight. And we're scrambling to get our environmental impact statement completely written and out the door and done. Um, we just had a meeting yesterday and did determine that it is the largest marine study that's ever been conducted on the face of the planet in terms of multidisciplinary pathways and whatnot. Um, so I want to see it benefit uh, not just uh, businesses, but I want to see it benefit universities, students, uh, people. It'd be great if there was a program here at the college and keep, you know, no, no, when, when I'm not here, tell Sean you want to do that, okay? <laughs> Say, hey, that guy that kept talking about this thing, do, do that. Yeah. Um, cool. Other questions? So, other questions over there? Yeah. Um, so, I was wondering, like, um, do, if there are these uh, deep sea environments happening at um, international waters, let's say, and the world decides to go in that direction, how is there any thought to the regulatory system that's going to be around that? And let's say there's two different people that are interested in those things. And then you can think that from waters, how would they settle potential disputes? Well, if they're the uh, the ocean was broken up into high speed. Well, first of all, seventy percent of the planet is ocean. Of that seventy percent, sixty percent is high seas. Forty percent is exclusive economic zones. So we're talking about that sixty percent, and that's entirely governed by consensus through the United Nations. Uh, and every question that you just sort of Wove into your astute remark is uh, is there? It's in there. Like lawyers can do that. They have a way of writing things that says, you know, when this situation like that, you can use the Stockholm Convention or shared resources or this or that. And yeah, no, they they really put a lot of work on this. And nobody's offered a degree in, in deep sea mining. It'd be a great way for you guys to. <laughs> 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 Not a degree, but a certificate, whatever it is. Yeah. Other questions? What, are, what companies are making these batteries like, from, I'd like, say, deep mining metals, like Tesla? And, uh, they, that's. That's the side of the house that I don't, I don't really work on. That side of the house, and I mean, so it wouldn't be a good person to ask. That's the case. I don't know you I don't know Elon. I know his brother and his cousin too well. They, they're trying to do do everything. Get all the materials to fly for themselves. The other companies are working well. They'll go out to the commodity markets and buy it. Yeah. And batteries will change. You know, it could be we won't need another battery for rich oil. Something else, but we do need them now. Yeah, the thing is, the lifespan on them is not very great. That's the big issue. I think for an hour, they don't last. You're saying that no, no, the other way around. The, the batteries will outlast the cars. Oh, yeah. 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 And right now, we don't have them. Right. 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 It's incredible how simple an electric car is. Uh, you know, I, I always thought electric car, you know, complicated. Oh, I don't understand it. But a very simple piece of machinery that is piece, easy to make. Very quite. Uh, that's what it's gone so deep into the AI to show their innovation. So, figure like 
the actual craft that's at the bottom fucking the rock. Is yeah. it uh is it like there's a person controlling it? No, it's like, yeah, that good question. No, the um I should have gone into some of the basics. No, it's there's nobody down there in that machine. Um, but there's a control room.